Hi, I'm Phil Harbottle, and this is my 70th video discussing British science fiction writers. E.C. Tubb is a name instantly recognised by readers of science fiction, but his novels and other genres are not nearly so well known, chiefly because they were first published under pseudonyms. This non-science fiction output comprised one historical foreign legion uh, novel, 11 westerns, which I've already discussed in my earlier video number 30, so they're not here. The Atlas, the Gladiator, Roman trilogy, trilogy of ancient Rome, and three detective novels. Bear with me. Now, some viewers might be surprised that Tubb published only three detective novels, and after reading them, they may be surprised he didn't publish many more. However, he has published numerous short stories. But always within the framework of science fiction. These short stories have a, a strong detective fiction element. And additionally, Many of his Jumrest uh, novels have strong detective elements, but it's in his shorter stories that he comes closest to Simon Pure detective fiction. In such stories as uh, Non-Entity, which we see here in this 1955 Authentic, and Reluctant Farmer in Nebula Science Fiction magazine. Now that was published in 1956. In Tubbs' stories, every action and reaction cannot just be allowed to happen fortuitously. It must have a logical reason. Thus, if the hero was caught in an ambush and shot at by the villain, it's not enough for the villain to simply miss, as miss he must to enable the story to continue, Tubb would seek to explain how the hero had heard the click of the trigger being pulled back, or caught a gleam of light reflected from the barrel of a weapon, etc. Something that instinctively causes the hero to dodge aside at the last moment. Tubb's fiction consistently employs the precise techniques of the best writers of detective fiction. This fact prompted me to ask the author why he hadn't written more detective novels. He told me, in all stories, logical development is important, but in the detective novel, it is essential. To write one with any degree of precision, it is necessary to know what's going to happen next and what the ending will be. Not the simplest thing if, as I do, you find it hard to plot in advance. Usually my stories, once started, tended to write themselves. Situations grew from situations and when writing SF and Westerns, there was plenty of movement and action to provide development. I could have started a detective novel easily enough, but then would have come the necessity of determining the plot, deciding who the villain should be, the motive, means and opportunity, worked out in a fair and logical fashion. As an analogy, to plot a good detective novel is like deciding in advance all the moves of an intricate game of chess. I found it a difficult thing to do. Short stories could be given a mystery or a criminal element, but to write a detective story as a detective story was too painful an exercise. Me a moment. Box 
assembled. How then did Tove come to write such an elaborate story? As assignment New York. Published this by Mike Landry, by John Spencer in 1956. A book that works on two different levels. Beginning as a traditional tough private eye investigation with a two-fisted Seamus who knows how to take punishment and dish it out as well, it becomes seamlessly integrated into a cerebral detective mystery. The tangled narrative strands are neatly tied up into a pleasing knot before Tubb triumphantly unveils them in a classic tradition of the detective story. The character of Mike Landry, his private eye narrator, is undoubtedly modelled from the classic Raymond Chandler mould, a hard-drinking, cynical private eye, slightly down at heel, but with a fine sense of chivalry and compassion. The opening plotline involving the Colonel and his missing daughter is reminiscent of Chandler's The Big Sleep, but once the story gets underway, Tubbs' plotting and writing become increasingly original. Tubb explained to me that at first, Assignment New York was written in his usual style at that time, which was not to do too much plotting in advance, but simply let the story and the characters flow. But Tubb came to the end of the story without having identified the murderer. I simply couldn't manage to solve the given problem before running out of space. In the 1950s, Mushroom Publishers limited the length of their novels to around 40,000 words. Tubb continued, There was nothing for it but to go back and rewrite the manuscript writing in the clues and developing motives, etc. The antithesis to my normal method of writing a novel. It took twice as long to finish it as it would with any other type of story. So that was the main reason why Tubb chose not to write another detective novel. But there were other reasons. Tubb had created Mike Landry at his publisher's request to launch a new series of private eye novels. But shortly thereafter, Tubb had been obliged to sever his connections with the publisher. He told me, At the time, Spencer's were a low peer market, and I was about to be appointed as the editor of Authentic Science Fiction. I was also doing a full-time job, which left only the evenings and weekends free. Weekends meaning half day Saturday and all day Sunday, during which time I tried to hit higher paying markets. So I informed Spencer's that I couldn't submit any further material for them as I was concentrating on SF, which offered a wider and more lucrative field. But the character of Mike Landry didn't die after just one book. The following year, the publishers commissioned another writer, another one of their writers, Anthony A. E. Glynn, to write a second Landry story. Glynn's book was entitled a gunman close behind. Many years later, after Tony Glynn became my client, I arranged for its reprinting by Borgo Books in the US and in the Linford Mystery Library, which we see there. Now, Tubbs' novel had been reprinted as the payoff by J.C. Barton, by Spencer's in 1961 as a badger book. And then in Australia, and it was also translated in Europe, all without Tubbs' knowledge or any further payment. But the situation was redressed when I had it reprinted. First by Gary Levis's Griffin Books in the United States in 1996, and then by the Linford Mystery Library in 2005, and also by Borgo Wildside in 2013. Bear with us a moment. To the next box. There we go. 
But back in the day, I thought that Job had not written any other detective novels until I made an exciting discovery. Job had written the Sexton Blake detective novel, which had been published under a house name, Arthur McLean. Touch of Evil, Sexton Blake, number 438, published in October 1959. Its discovery was something of a detective story in itself. In my continuing search for hitherto unknown John Russell Fern stories, I'd started examining any pseudonymous late 1950s Blake novels that I came across to check whether it might have been written by Fern. In the event, Fern hadn't written anything for Sexton Blake, so I was wasting my time. But I was rewarded when I read the opening chapters of Touch of Evil, which contained a dramatic sequence in which, a, in which a young woman falls to her death. I suddenly recognized this as having been written by Tubb because it resonated with the opening of his 1954 science fiction serial, The Inevitable Conflict, in the first issue of the Borgo Staten science fiction magazine. In this story, you see there that a man is falling messily to his death, just like the woman in the Sexton Blake story. Now, I thoroughly enjoyed the rest of the novel, Sorry, I enjoyed the rest of the novel. Finished it. I was convinced it was by the sea tub. The story tells of a secret alien invasion in a remote rocket research station in Scotland. A rocket probe into outer space has unwittingly brought back to Earth microscopic alien parasites which can enter the bloodstream and take over individual consciousness. The story briskly explores the consequences with a nice sense of paranoia. Sexton Blake and his associates are called in to investigate the odd happenings at the station, and Blake foils the alien threat in a satisfying mixture of detection and action. I promptly contacted Tug to verify my discovery and to ask if he'd written any other Blake novels. After confirming his, his authorship, see there, he's signed the book, it's been by him and not by the fictitious author McLean. After confirming his authorship, Tug told me that he declined to contribute any more Sexton Blake stories after his fee had been reduced by some editorial sharp practice. Deductions were made for some totally unnecessary editorial revisions, supposedly required to keep it in the Blake canon. Tubb told me this was a scam on freelance authors writing for hire on the Blake series. The doctored novels were then published in the house names such as Arthur McLean or Desmond Reed, etc. Ted had been considerably peeved but he was to have his revenge many years later after I became his agent. After taking early retirement from my local government career to become a full-time writer and literary agent, I was soon engaged in agenting hundreds of detective novels to the Linford Mystery Series, large print, including scores by Gerald Werner, acting for his son. Chris Werner told me how many of these stories by his father had first been written as Sexton Blake novels in the 1930s. But shortly thereafter, Werner had deblaked the novels by rewriting them with the insertion of his own characters in place of Blake and his assistants. The author was then free to resell the novels elsewhere as under his own copyright. 
This gave me the bright idea of debaking Ted's novel and reselling it as a new book to Linford in 2005. Reselling it to Linford in 2005. The author was then free to resell the novels elsewhere as under his own copyright. This gave me the bright idea of debaking Ted's novel and reselling it as a new book to Linford in 2005, retitled as The Possessed. Poetic Justice. The novel was translated into Italian in 2012, where it won for its publisher an award for the best translated science fiction novel of the year. It's set to be reprinted by uh, Wildside later this year. Here we see the superb Italian edition, which a science fiction convention in Rome awarded the title of the best translated novel of the year. And there's an original Italian illustration. So Ted got well paid for those editions. The story tells of a truly terrifying menace lurking in the remote Scottish Highlands. It seemed to be centred at a government research establishment, but without definite proof of the exact nature of the menace, the authorities cannot act decisively. It's up to the ace detective Martin Slade to investigate and find that proof, even at the cost of his own life. Tubbs' third detective novel, the near-future dystopia, dystopia, was entitled To Dream Again. It had been written in 1969, but his then-agent had failed to sell it. Tubb then cannibalised it, condensing it to create a novelette, Full Five. We'll come back to this book in a minute. There is see my magazine, Vision of Tomorrow, which I, I was the editor of, and Tub sent me a condensed version of that novel as full five. You see it there, illustrated by Eddie Jones. It was published in Vision of Tomorrow, number six, March 1970. It tells how, in the 21st century, the world is overcrowded and brutalised by sensation seekers in search of sadistic thrills. A chemist discovers a drug which stimulates all five senses, the ultimate and hallucinogens, the distribution of which will have a devastating repercussion. It wasn't until 2010, after learning from Ted of the novel's existence, that I asked him to send me the unpublished manuscript. This was a really powerful story, but unfortunately, it was vitiated by having been written long before the invention of the internet. The absence of that made the story impossible to publish today. So, in retyping the battered manuscript, I myself did some rewriting to account for the internet having been suppressed in the novel's imagined future and submitted it in a new 54,000 word version to the Linford Mystery Library. Now, this fixing took me some considerable time during which interval Ted had fallen gravely ill. But to my delight, at length, Linford accepted it. My instinct was to telephone Ted at once to tell him the good news, but mindful that he was ill, I decided to write to him instead. The following day, just as I was about to post a letter, I received a sad phone call myself, informing me that Ted had died during the night. So the novel was published posthumously in 2011. 
It tells of Ralph Mancini, an officer in the United Nations Law Enforcement Agency, which is dedicated to the worldwide war on drugs, whilst working with the national and international police forces. But now an insidious new drug, Full 5, is being developed, one in which the people taking it experience a trip like no other. They become, in effect, godlike beings, and once they've experienced heaven, they can think of nothing but their next trip, whatever the cost. Ralph and Inspector Frere follow a tangled trail of murder and intrigue to find the source of the peril, but they may be too late to stop the drug from spreading across the world. The novel is a brilliant, dark, harrowing vision of the future, which nowadays seems alarmingly plausible. Just a moment. Now back in 1997, I'd compiled a new Griffin Books collection, Murder in Space. I'll see it here with an original Ron Turner cover. Now as agent for Tubbs family, I began editing further new collections of his science fiction mystery and detective short stories. Here. Here we see these new collections, all science fiction detective stories. There's the wager. The Ming Vars. Enemy of the State, Tomorrow, and Only One Winner. And on the bottom line here, we see them in the Linford Mystery Editions. They were published by both Linford Mystery and Borgo Wildside, as I've said. Now, interested science fiction and detective fans should snap these up online now before they become expensive collector's items like Assignment New York and Touch of Evil. <laughs>